Hey guys, Nintendo here. You guys asked for it and here it is. Today we are headed back into the glitchy, poorly translated world of bootleg game consoles. Last time I showed off a few of my handheld bootleg systems from my collection, but today we've got a bit more variety. All in all, we've got six more systems to get through in today's video, so without further ado, let's get started. Alright, so first up is the MGP Slim Station. Now, I bought this because at first glance, I thought it might be a rarely seen Sega Genesis or Sega Master System clone for pretty obvious reasons. It looks just like a stylized version of Sonic the Hedgehog. I chose the red model for myself, but they do also sell this unit in blue. So you can imagine how I felt when I turned it on and found out that this console is yet another NES clone. Famiclones are, in my experience, far and away the most common type of bootleg you'll see on the market. So if you've seen one of these before, you probably know about what to expect. Hardware-wise, there are a couple things that set this guy apart. Uh, the super small design and plastic loop seem to imply that the MGP Slim Station is meant to be carried around like a keychain, and funny enough, it also comes with a built-in LED flashlight. Uh, the joystick is oddly stiff, yet mushy, not surprising, and the top of the system is where you plug in the AV cables. So let's hook it up and see what adventures await us. Now I will say this is the only bootleg system I've seen with support for multiple languages. When you start it up, you can swap between Chinese and English menus. Of course, this doesn't change anything about the games themselves, but it is an interesting feature. Unlike the consoles we covered last time, which claimed they had, in some cases, upwards of 1 million built-in titles, the MGP Slim Station claims to have just 89. Much more believable in comparison. So, what's the first game on this new list? Oh no. Not again. <laughs> I don't know exactly why, but whoever's making these knockoff systems must be really excited about Angry Birds. This awful homebrew game is making its way onto every one of these things. Thankfully, this seems to be a bit of an outlier for this console. Most of the games on here are just normal, unlicensed NES games like Super Mario Bros. and other assorted classics. With a few exceptions, such as, uh, uh Donkey Kong? Oh geez, what happened to you, DK? That smile is terrifying. <laughs> Ugh. There's also a hack of adventure island called Hellfire. Not sure what the story is there. And capping off the list of games is Fast Bros. I assume they meant to write Fast Bros, as this is a variation of Super Mario Bros., but I've gotta say it's one of the laziest attempts I've seen. Fast Bros is just Super Mario Bros., but the game starts at World 3. For those of us with busy schedules and less time to devote to gaming, Fast Bros is here to help by cutting out the first two worlds of the game. Really stretching for that arbitrary game count of 89, huh? So that's about it for this one, nothing too remarkable. Next up, I'm going to cover a few of these together because the next four consoles are all from the same sort of line from a company known as Dream Gear. Now, unlike the others I've shown which are generally sold direct from overseas, these systems are sold on store shelves and can actually be found at pharmacies and drugstores like CVS and Walgreens. They'll often have them in the kids section next to electronic toys and trading cards. Generally, bootleg game consoles are rarely found in big name stores like this because there are some big legal issues with selling cheap systems running unlicensed copyrighted software. But Dream Gear has an interesting way of getting around those restrictions, which we'll take a look at shortly. First, let's take a glance at each console's hardware. First up, we've got the Dream Gear Retro Play Controller. Again, like the MGP Slim Station, this one is super tiny, and in this case it's designed to look like a set of arcade controls. Once again, we've got an AV port up top for connecting to the TV, and as we can see on the front, this guy claims to have 200 titles built in. Moving along, the second Dream Gear plug and play is the My Arcade Retro Micro Controller. And aside from a visual shift, this one is almost identical to the one before it. Of course, it's been changed to resemble a more modern controller shape, but we've still got the one D-pad, two face buttons, and an AV port up top. This one is advertised as having 220 titles, just a few more than the last. Next up is the My Arcade Gamer V Portable, which is an all-in-one handheld version of the My Arcade line, again with an advertised 220 titles. Of course, the big difference here is that this one doesn't output to the TV, but rather has a built-in screen for on-the-go play. And finally, we have the Retro Arcade Machine X, which seems to have run with the design of the first system and developed it into a miniature upright arcade cabinet handheld. Again, this one does not connect to a television, but rather has a built-in backlit screen. Because these systems share a great deal of the same games, we'll be covering them all together, so let's take a look at what they have to offer. If you've been paying attention, you probably know what's coming. All of these systems, except for the Retro Arcade Machine, are Famiclones yet again. Now, I did some research and found that most of the games on these systems were produced by a Chinese developer known as Nice Code Software. Each system runs a library of original homebrew titles for NES, with some legally distinct ROM hacks thrown in here and there. 
This makes the My Arcade line unique because, unlike most Famiclones which run a myriad of unlicensed games, these systems actually have at least somewhat original libraries. This is why they're able to be sold on store shelves in the US. Nice Code Software are responsible for many homebrews and ROM hacks we've seen across the world of bootleg consoles, including the timeless classic Magic Joni. Because nutrition sucked by the huge monsters, soar all the plants have shriving one. This atmosphere of peace has been destroyed. The green land is becoming to wasteland, and people's lives were also threatened by monsters. Till one day a little hero called Joni has come up, he must defeat all these monsters by his magic flower. Really pulls at your heartstrings. We've also got Police Dog La Lacy? La Lazy? Lassie? A game in which the Green Goblin comes into someone's backyard and buries a ticking time bomb, some drugs, a gun, and other assorted contraband. Your goal as Lassie is to avoid the bombs and find the buried evidence. What you got there, girl? A bag of coke? Yeah, this one's great for the kids. Let's see, we've got Pong Pong. Is that like Ping Pong, but without a partner? Well, no, but it's got some of the most obtuse controls I've ever dealt with from an NES title. You press left or right on the joystick to tilt your little bumper car thing tank style, and try to push the blue enemies into one of the holes in each corner of the map. Kind of like an even more obnoxious version of the big bully from Super Mario 64. This guy, everybody's favorite, right? We've also got the adventures of everyone's favorite up-and-coming superhero, Through Man! My best guess is he's called Through Man because he flies through the air? I don't know, kind of a stretch. You play as a little kid with a jetpack shooting innocent birds out of the sky while avoiding obstacles at a breakneck pace. Let's check out Fish War. Oh, it's just Balloon Fight. This is where we're starting to see some of those derivative ROM hacks come through. Uh, there's Hit Mouse, continuing with our animal violence theme. Somebody call PETA. Uh, it's just Whack-A-Mole. Yeah, those definitely look like mice. Sometimes the moles are different colors, but that doesn't seem to change anything. Sometimes the mole is a green bean. Who cares? It's a video game, am I right? Also, you can literally just spin the joystick in a circle and hit everything. There's no penalty for pressing the wrong direction. I mean, there's not even a penalty for not whacking the moles. Every stage is 60 seconds long, and when time's up, it shows you your score and just moves on to the next stage, which is essentially identical. A lot of love went into this one, guys. A cult classic, for sure. Here's the thrilling title, Move Box. Just an NES version of the classic stacking puzzle with three levels. Riveting. Then we've got Goblet Tower. It's the exact same game. Strong PJCC? Pidgeic? Oh, Strong Pill! Guess they misread the font. Looks like we've got a California Raisin pushing a pot from Zelda. Is that what's going on? Oh, it's just one of these where you gotta push the things to get the thing. But hold on, there, there's one problem here. Despite the fact that all these pieces look identical, as far as I can tell you can only push the pieces required to solve the puzzle, which basically takes out any sort of challenge or strategy. So you've just gotta wander around and hope something moves. Yeah, great game design, A+. Let's see, what is Jump Jump? So it's Doodle Jump, but really bad. The physics are basically non-existent. For being featured twice in the game's title, the jumping sure feels super weird. And what is this character supposed to be? Really, it looks like some sort of Muppet with a graduation cap. What'd you get your degree in, buddy? Uh, Id idiot studies? Ah, whatever, I've played too much of this, my brain is turning to sludge. UFO race, please select. Well, seeing as there's no select button on this controller and none of the other buttons do anything, I think you're out of luck, bud. Ah well. Pro tip for all you fledgling game designers out there, if you want to make a game but don't want a big art budget, just say it's a space game and make your backdrops nothing but darkness. I mean really, if it weren't for the occasional pole on either side of the track, I would have no idea that I'm supposed to be moving forward. I do want to point out here though, it gives me great joy that they misspelled score up here in the corner as scro. <laughs> Alright, next. Zero Gravity. Oh, another Balloon Fight clone! Not only that, but this one shamelessly ripped off the music and sound of the original too. I'm sure Satoru Iwata would be so proud. And there is most certainly not zero gravity in this situation. What do you call this? I call it false advertising. Hoodle? What the heck is Hoodle? Oh, Hoodle is pinball. Got it. Looks like one of those unlicensed games fell through the cracks, Dream Gear. Next up we've got, uh, uh, uh re Rescue Cuck? Uh, okay. Ah, it's a ROM hack of Donkey Kong Jr. I don't know what's going on here, but I can tell you I don't like it. Let's move on. <laughs> Graders, they just took the Gradius logo and changed the U to an R. How sad. IQ Champion, finally I can put all that Rick and Morty knowledge to the test. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that your IQ was based on how well you can shoot bees. Look, my IQ is already over 2000, beat that Stephen Hawking. 
And finally, we've got Hurry Burry. Oh, wow, that is terrifying. <laughs> what is going on with the art here? Is that supposed to be like that? Is there any point in asking? The world may never know. So yeah, quite a lineup there for the Dream Gear systems, but I think you'll agree I've saved the best for last. The final bootleg game console we'll be checking out today is the Power Player Racer 2017 Super Joystick Plug and Play Video Game System. Yes, that is actually what this thing is called. And judging by the packaging, we are in for a treat. Not only does this one boast 76,000 games in one, but it's also apparently the most impressive TV game machine made yet. Looks like we've got some art from some modern games, including what appears to be a screen from Just Cause 3, so I'm expecting some major horsepower out of this guy. So what are we waiting for? Let's turn it on. <sighs> oh, it's a Famiclone. Fun time, 76,000 in one. Yeah, I'll be the judge of that. It looks like most of these are just the regular set of unlicensed NES games, nothing really new, aside from a few funny spelling issues, like Wild Gu Man? And, uh, w what is this? Mice Love Cat? Oh, it's just Mappy. Well, you're not wrong, I guess. But what confuses me is we've also got Mappy listed with the correct title at number 73. In fact, it seems this system has less than 70 ROMs altogether, which, if you'll recall, is 1 1,000th of the number advertised. <laughs> Interestingly, it seems like in addition to randomizing the order of games and repeating them, they've also randomly generated a three-letter suffix for each entry in order to make their titles unique. Pretty sneaky there, guys. You almost got me. Another thing I find interesting, like in the case of Dr. Mario, is that bootleg systems will often edit out the title screen logo as if that justifies them stealing the game for their own system. <laughs> Look, we're not even trying anymore. Here we've got Slalom, misspelled as Slackum, listed three times on one page. Well, so much for Just Cause 3. I guess I'll have to settle for a game of Slackum. So that's about it. With this, we've covered all of the bootleg consoles in my collection, but definitely let me know down in the comments if you enjoyed this episode, and I'll keep my eye out for more down the road. As always, if you did enjoy the video, please do consider subscribing to Nintendo for all sorts of cool gaming content, and make sure to share the video with any friends who might find it interesting. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye! Hey guys, thanks again for checking out the video and for making it all the way to the end. Hope you enjoyed. As always, I've got links to all my social media in the description below. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, that sort of thing. And if you'd like to help out even more, I've got a link to my Patreon on the right side of your screen. Otherwise, I hope you'll look out for the next video. Take care.